Dream Chaser's Vertex engine just solved a puzzle no one else could crack. It switches between single-fuel hydrogen peroxide mode for low thrust and dual-fuel kerosene peroxide mix for high power, all in one system. NASA called it a certification nightmare, too complex to approve. But here's what changed everything. The Department of Defense just funded a massive 16-ton thrust version of this exact engine technology. While Sierra Space runs dangerously low on cash and NASA backs away from guaranteed missions, military contracts are pouring in. Could this dual-mode breakthrough turn Dream Chaser from a dying program into the Pentagon's next secret weapon? Let's rewind to where this all started. For 30 years, people dreamed of bringing back the shuttle experience. Runway landings, graceful gliding re-entries, that iconic image of a winged spacecraft touching down on Earth. When NASA retired the space shuttle in 2011 after tragic accidents and billion-dollar maintenance costs, everyone assumed that Dream died with it. Dragon capsules took over, splashing down in the ocean like the Apollo era. Efficient? Yes. Inspiring. Not quite the same. Sierra Space saw an opening. They pitched Dream Chaser as the shuttle's true successor, a sleek lifting body that could land on any commercial runway. NASA loved the concept and awarded them a cargo contract worth up to seven missions to the International Space Station. The space community erupted with excitement. Finally, wings were coming back to space. But then reality hit harder than anyone expected. What went wrong in those critical years? The problem started piling up fast. Sierra Space burned through cash testing the Vertex engine, that revolutionary dual-mode propulsion system we mentioned earlier. Every certification test cost millions. The engine had to prove it could switch between hydrogen peroxide for gentle maneuvers and kerosene peroxide mix for high thrust, all without a single failure. No spacecraft engine had ever attempted this complexity before. NASA's safety board demanded proof after proof, especially after watching Boeing's Starliner software disasters unfold. Each delay meant more money, and Sierra Space was running out of both time and funding. Reports from industry insiders paint a brutal picture. The company became extremely cash-strapped by 2023. Engineers knew Dream Chaser could have flown two years earlier, but they couldn't afford the testing facilities at peak rates. So they waited. They waited for those facilities to go idle, offering discounted prices for off-peak testing slots. Smart financial move? Maybe. But it cost them something more valuable than money. Credibility. When your spacecraft sits in a hangar for years while competitors fly, investors get nervous. NASA gets nervous. And suddenly your revolutionary design starts looking like vaporware. Here's where it gets interesting. NASA quietly changed the contract terms in late 2024. Instead of Dream Chaser docking with the ISS on its very first flight, they restructured it as a free-flyer mission. Launch, orbit for a few days, run some tests, then come home. No station approach, no docking, no cargo delivery. The agency also removed their obligation to purchase follow-on missions from the original contract language. To outsiders, this looked like NASA preparing an escape hatch. Why would the space agency back away unless they expected failure? But read between those contract modifications. NASA didn't cancel anything. They didn't cut the total mission count from seven. They didn't walk away. What they did was brilliant risk management, learned the hard way from Boeing's mistakes. Remember Starliner's first uncrewed test flight in 2019? It tried to dock with the ISS immediately and failed spectacularly due to software errors. The spacecraft couldn't even reach the station. NASA had to abort, and Boeing's reputation took a hit it still hasn't recovered from. 
Two years later, Starliner tried again and barely made it work. Now the agency is stuck defending a vehicle that's proven unreliable, while taxpayers demand answers about wasted contracts. NASA learned from that disaster. By splitting Dream Chaser's missions into separate goals, first prove the spacecraft works, then prove it can dock, they're protecting both the $150 billion space station and the program itself. Think about the nightmare scenario everyone feared. Dream Chaser's inaugural flight approaches the ISS at 17,500 miles per hour. A minor glitch occurs during final approach. Maybe the rendezvous sensors hiccup. Maybe a thruster misfires. Suddenly you've got an uncontrolled spacecraft near humanity's most expensive orbiting laboratory. Emergency abort. Global headlines. Congressional hearings. The program gets branded a failure before it even begins, and public support evaporates overnight. The Free Flyer approach rewrites that entire narrative. Dream Chaser launches, demonstrates its most critical capabilities away from the station where mistakes aren't catastrophic, then returns via autonomous runway landing at Kennedy Space Center. If something breaks during re-entry, engineers gather data and fix it for the next test. If the thermal protection system underperforms, they learn without risking the ISS. And if everything works perfectly, then Dream Chaser enters its next phase from a position of strength, with proven flight heritage instead of PowerPoint promises. Does this strategy sound like NASA abandoning the program, or NASA finally getting smarter about how they validate new spacecraft? Now let's talk about what makes Dream Chaser genuinely revolutionary beyond the headlines. The Vertex engine isn't just about switching fuels. It represents a fundamental shift in how spacecraft propulsion works. Traditional engines are single-purpose. You design them for one fuel mixture, one thrust level, one specific job. Dream Chaser's engine adapts to the mission in real time. Need gentle station-keeping maneuvers, Run on hydrogen peroxide alone at low thrust. Time for orbital insertion or deorbit burn. Switch to kerosene peroxide dual fuel mode for maximum power. Two completely different engine personalities in one compact package. This matters more than most people realize. Every kilogram you launch costs roughly $2,700 on Falcon 9, less on Starship, but still significant. By combining multiple engine functions into one system, Dream Chaser saves mass, which saves money, which makes the entire business case viable. The Department of Defense noticed this immediately. They didn't just notice. They funded development of a scaled-up 16-ton thrust version using the same core technology. Military contracts don't get awarded to interesting ideas. They go to proven capabilities that solve real problems. What problems does the Pentagon see that we don't? Then there's the Shooting Star Service Module, Dream Chaser's Detachable Cargo Section. This component confused a lot of observers because it seems wasteful. The module carries power systems, propulsion, thermal control, even a pressurized cargo bay, essentially a second spacecraft. After each mission, it detaches and burns up in the atmosphere. Critics called it inefficient, comparing it unfavorably to Dragon's fully reusable design. But they're missing the strategic advantage. Shooting Star's disposable nature means Dream Chaser can dump trash, failed experiments, and hazardous materials during every return flight. The ISS generates tons of waste with nowhere to put it. Currently, cargo vehicles either bring trash back to Earth, expensive, or burn it up on re-entry, inefficient for valuable spacecraft. Shooting Star does both, carries cargo up, brings critical items down in the reusable Dream Chaser, and disposes of waste automatically. Plus, by putting complex systems in the disposable module, Sierra Space can upgrade them every flight without recertifying the entire spacecraft. New battery technology? Swap it into the next shooting star. Better propulsion. Same deal. 
the crew cabin stays consistent while the service module evolves. Is this inefficiency, or is it flexibility that Dragon can't match? But here's the part that changed everything, the reason Dream Chaser might survive when everyone expects it to fail. Sierra Space stopped chasing NASA's shrinking ISS budget and pivoted toward military applications. The U.S. Air Force operates the X-37B, a classified space plane that's been flying mysterious multi-year missions since 2010. Nobody knows exactly what it does, but we know it lands on runways, stays in orbit for extended periods, and represents capabilities the Pentagon values enough to keep funding for over a decade. Dream Chaser offers similar runway landing, rapid turnaround between missions, and lifting body aerodynamics that provide cross-range maneuverability during re-entry. That last point deserves explanation. When a capsule like Dragon returns from orbit, it basically falls. Parachutes slow it down, but you can't steer a parachute with much precision. Your landing zone is wherever physics and weather decide. Dream Chaser's wings give it 1,000 miles of cross-range capability. Launch from Vandenberg, land at Kennedy, or vice versa. This matters enormously for military missions requiring flexible recovery sites and rapid response capabilities. The Department of Defense funding that 16-ton Vertex engine variant isn't coincidence. They're investing in infrastructure for a spacecraft that could complement or eventually replace X-37B for certain missions. Meanwhile, the commercial space station market is exploding. Axiom, Blue Origin, Vast Space, and others are building private stations to replace the ISS when it retires around 2030. These companies need reliable cargo delivery, and they're not bound by NASA's bureaucratic procurement rules. Dream Chaser is launcher agnostic, meaning it can fly on Vulcan Centaur, Falcon 9, even New Glenn when that becomes operational. Dragon is locked to SpaceX's rockets. Starliner only flies on Atlas V, and eventually Vulcan. Dream Chaser's flexibility becomes a massive competitive advantage when commercial stations need vehicles that work with multiple launch providers. Sierra Space's parent company, Sierra Nevada Corporation, has deep defense contracts and steady revenue from aircraft systems and military technology. They're not a startup gambling everything on one spacecraft. This provides staying power that pure play space companies lack. When cash runs tight on the Dream Chaser program, the parent company can and has provided bridge funding. When testing delays push timelines, they absorb the costs rather than collapsing. This corporate structure might be the difference between Dream Chaser flying in 2025 versus becoming another museum exhibit of ambitious failures. The comparison to early SpaceX is unavoidable. Between 2008 and 2012, Falcon 9 and Dragon faced identical skepticism. Too ambitious. Unproven technology. NASA shouldn't trust a private company with crew safety. Experts predicted failure. Competitors dismissed them. Yet Dragon became America's only reliable crew vehicle after Starliner stumbled. Sierra Space is following a similar path. Slow, expensive, frustrating, but potentially revolutionary if they cross the finish line. The difference is SpaceX had Elon Musk's billions backing them. Sierra Space has to prove value before unlocking their next round of funding. Does that make success less likely, or does it force them to build something genuinely better than the competition? So here's what we're really watching unfold. Dream Chaser isn't dying. It's evolving into something NASA never originally planned for. That dual-mode vertex engine that seemed like an over-engineered certification nightmare. It's now attracting Pentagon contracts worth potentially billions. The cash-strapped company running on fumes? They're backed by a defense contractor with steady military revenue streams. NASA stepping back from guaranteed ISS missions? 
They're actually protecting the program from a Starliner-style disaster while opening doors to commercial station contracts worth far more than seven ISS flights. The real story isn't about whether Dream Chaser reaches the space station next year. It's about whether Sierra Space successfully pivoted from chasing NASA's shrinking budget to capturing military and commercial markets that dwarf anything the ISS could offer. That Vertex engine breakthrough didn't just solve a propulsion problem. It created a technology the Department of Defense wants to scale up, giving Dream Chaser a revenue path that doesn't depend on NASA's approval at all. Twenty years of development, countless setbacks, funding crises that should have killed the program three times over. Yet Dream Chaser keeps adapting, keeps surviving. The lifting body design that failed for decades might finally work because Sierra Space stuck with it long enough to solve problems nobody else could. Sometimes the difference between revolutionary and ridiculous is just refusing to quit. If Dream Chaser successfully lands on a runway in 2025, we're not just getting another cargo vehicle. We're watching the birth of a new spacecraft category that bridges military, commercial, and scientific missions simultaneously. What do you think happens when that first autonomous runway landing succeeds? Drop your predictions in the comments. And if you want to follow Dream Chaser's next moves as they happen, subscribe to New Space Review and hit that notification bell. This story is far from over.